So thank you so much, um, my dear friend, Melissa Faber-Castell, and thank you so much to Steffi Czerne, because without you, Steffi, we wouldn't be here, and without your generosity, and without Hans Ulrich Obrist's generosity, uh, we wouldn't stay here to talk about this very uh, serious uh, topic, um, because we will see that well-being is in a situation where we are still in the midst of a pandemic and in a huge environmental crisis, definitely not solvable with the youngest talents, with the youngest uh, um, uh, thinkers, thought leaders, that sometimes are keeping the oldest uh, wisdom. And this is why I'm, I'm so happy to, uh, to be uh, able now to introduce um, uh, my panel. This is Sumaya Wali. Uh, please come on the stage, Sumaya. A big round of applause for Sumaya Wali. Sumaya is coming from Johannesburg. She created uh, until today as the youngest uh, architect um, the Serpentine Pavilion of last year's uh, pavilion program. And we are so happy that we can work uh, with you together on many other commissions that are enhancing the well-being uh, of the people in cities. And then Jean de Cron. Please a big round of applause of, for Jean de Cron. Uh, she is coming from a old waiver family in the Netherlands, but she is now waving uh, different worlds together, different cultures together. She's creating our indigenous outreach program, and I'm so happy that Nina Guerlinga is here from Ecuador. Nina, please come to the stage, and a big round of applause. <laughs> Nina Guerlinga is, um, is not only an indigenous rights activist, but she is also an advocate of climate justice, and I'm so happy that you are here with us. And then um, Moran, please come also on the stage. Moran gives a big round of applause for Moran. We just met. I think I need another chair, right? So um, Moran is uh, the missing uh, piece of puzzle in this round because he brings the scientific perspective. And we will see that science today is, um, is a, um, a necessary, science is rediscovering what old cultures and wisdoms already knew for many, many. Cl closer with the chair, yeah. Like this. Ah, here's my. So, first, I wanted to give a short. Um, view on the, on, on the global situation of well-being. So we are in a situation where, uh, where, where the data is talking about a wellness, global wellness sector of 4.5 trillion US dollar value. But this, um, this value uh, is um, addressing only the wellness aspect. Uh, what we are usually not addressing are all the costs that are created through the lack of well-being. We see that well-being is something that if we are not well, we are getting already sick. So you have one example that uh, is uh, standing out to me. This is the vitamin D deficiency um, that was one of the most uh, and biggest triggers of severity during the uh, COVID pandemic. So 14 times higher was the chance when you were um, with vitamin D deficiency to, um, to, to have a severe condition. Um, and this vitamin D deficiency is a deficiency that we created not through um, a medical condition. It's a medical condition we created through city planning, through urban planning. So this is why, Sumaya, I would like you to tell us about your take on well-being from an architect's perspective. Yes, um, so I don't know if we want to show one of the slides, but earlier when we were talking, we were talking about situations of the opposite of well-being. And I'm from South Africa, as you mentioned, and in my city, Johannesburg, which is an incredibly vibrant, creative, energetic city, we're also grappling with so many centuries of inequality. And um, cities in South Africa and places in South Africa were really unequal by design, uh, which is something that we have to deal with every day. So segregation was absolutely entrenched in our planning. And of course, most cities are like this, but Johannesburg is an extreme example. Um, and so when we think about well-being and cities, I think it's really important that we work to re-engage these things, that we have a re-reckoning with the earth and with the land. 
um, that we listen to the ground, we listen to what's beneath our feet, we listen to our ancestors, and in doing that, we also listen to the present and the future. So what would be, we have some slides that we prepared, what would be like your like, um, a picture that, that is picturing well-being and what would be the picture that is picturing the lack of well-being? Um, I don't know if we want to skip down. Oh, yeah, I have to skip them. Right. Oh, sorry. So this is um, a, an apartheid city diagram, which really shows um, the way that apartheid was planned and that different ethnicities and race groups had to live very separate from each other. But what's really interesting here is that we also start to see how buffers were used. So nature was employed in segregating people. If we look at the river, that it was used as a divisive force. When actually, of course, as we know, natural forces in our lives should be um, embraced and we should be working with them rather than using them to separate us. In South Africa in particular and in Johannesburg, um, mine dumps, so when our city was mined, the waste from the, from the mining was actually used to segregate people, which we can see in the next slide, is still something that's really present with us. And so sometimes I think, um, and of course we know, we know this much more deeply now, we need to realize and reckon with the consequences of our actions. And um, this is something that's occurring in the city that's causing continual atmospheric violence. It was so deeply planned um, that black people in South Africa lived next to mine dumps down to the direction of the wind um, was taken into account. So mine dumps in Johannesburg blow over historically black townships and this has led to atmospheric violence in the form of generational lung disease and um, you know, of course, they were used as very physical buffer zones to separate people from economic opportunity as well. So from a very macro scale down to the microscopic scale of dust, um, everything about the opposite of our city's well-being well was meticulously planned. Um, and then in the next slide, uh, this is very, very old. I actually drew this when I was a student. Um, but this is about uh, re-reckoning with the land that engages with the toxic consequences of our city, but also engages with creating new rituals that are about listening to the ground, that are about rendering um, conscious again. So uh, we, we see that basically well-being is something where the human condition of the individual can be actually connected with something that you can see already from a satellite picture, right? So, and there's like an inherent basically one health relationship actually with the federal minister of uh, science and education that was just speaking before us. Who, uh, she inaugurated the One Health uh, Institute of the Helmholtz Society last month, uh, where we became the first industry partner. And somehow we understand today that um, we cannot see the well-being of an individual human without actually connecting it to the well-being of the environment and the well-being of um, of the planet in itself. So there's basically no action that we can disconnect. So to, um, like, do, do we have um, also a positive well-being uh, picture um, presented? Uh, ah, so this is, um, I think, something to talk about later, but uh, this is, of course, the pavilion that Terma acquired. And in this project, I think, for me, this project is really about listening to and honoring ancestors from everywhere. And so in this project, we worked with gathering spaces from across London that were important to uh, migrations that allowed people to construct home and construct belonging when they first moved to the city. And the surfaces and the forms in this pavilion honor those forms of gathering, but also something that's very important to the pavilion and, and that, that the Serpentine and Terma really supported was this diasporic logic of the pavilion in that we have fragments of the pavilion around the city. Um, and through those, we've seeded collaborations with community arts organizations and institutions that is something that's continuing. Of course, hopefully in our upcoming project, Making Ground, we also have um, 
a, a deeper engagement with land through this garden that we're creating. And so I think when we think of an architectural project, it's really important to think beyond the scope of the finite building. Um, and I think, of course, architects are taught to do this and we talk about it, but what does that mean in physical terms? I think we need to also think about beyond the building, how we work to see collaborations, how we work to engage community in many different forms. So you mentioned the project Making Ground. This is a commission that we're working on together, so we are super blessed to have you basically um, doing a project that will go back and listen actually to the ancestors of migration communities in Manchester, where we are building a thermal, a thermal group facility. Um, but it's a satellite project within an urban development. And uh, I, I, I find the idea of you know, listening to the ancestors and listening to practices where we weren't yet disconnected from nature and where humans and nature were living in a kind of um, homoestatic relationship, absolutely necessary as a radical practice to come back also in our industrialized uh, civilization to a different relationship to nature. And Jean de Caen, you are actually, as I said in the beginning, you are waving worlds together. So we are creating our indigenous outreach program, but you are also created Zazi Vintage. This is a um, brand that is uh, basically working with empowered women communities that are leading um, uh, the production of sustainable fashion. And can you tell us from your perspective um, what is um, for you like, like the, the essence of well-being when, when you travel the world? Where's the place where you feel like mostly it works? And where's the place where you feel it doesn't? Yeah, so as Miguel said, I come from a weaver's family. Um, my last name is a part of a 16th century weaving machine. And I think creativity or art, like any industry in the world, has the power to change narratives. It is a woven story. And um, growing up with like a mother that was in, in, uh, in art and, uh, and fashion history, I was totally enchanted by like the stories that it could have. Um, but that led me on a discovery course when I got scouted as a very unsuccessful model when I was 18. And I ended up in New York in a polyester dress with a lot of makeup on. And I just had this epiphany of being like, but wait a minute, like, this is the thing that I've always... This is this photo? <laughs> yeah, it's like very, like, 18-year-old jam, not knowing. There's like the lady underneath it. But I remember there was this plastic dress and just a lot of makeup on, and I was like, if I'm not even the story that I'm supposed to transmit, then what is the real story? And um, through that and through my travels, I learned that, I learned about the neo-colonial supply chain. I learned about the story that my face was masking um, uh, through these images in, you know, that we admire in the, in, the, in the magazines and in the fashion campaigns. And I saw the dest destruction both on a human rights level, but also on an environmental level. I remember sitting in India and seeing like rivers bulping with like chemical waste every single day in a new color, depending on which dyes they use in the material. I mean, as you know, that fashion is the second largest polluter of the world right now. It is also a multi-trillion dollar industry. It has the power of great destruction, which it has right now, but also the, the power of great change. Um, fashion is also an industry that makes up of more than 80% of women who own less than 10% of global capital in fashion, but also own 8% of the land that is used for fashion. So it makes it into a feminist issue. And I think the beauty of creativity, when you think about creativity, it is always, it comes from the Latin word creare, which is to create, but also you always create, you co-create with your surroundment which is material, and material comes from the word matter, which means mother. So I think this inherent wisdom that, that women have always had to create with something, with, with a consciousness of taking something from the great mother has led me to uh, set up my company in my student bedroom with an incredible change maker called Madhu Vaishnav in rural India. Um, so I've been using, so for me, well-being really is coming back to this place where we can re use creativity to spark us with an image of what a well-nourished and purposeful and beautiful creation can mean that doesn't only thrive yourself, but also thrives the communities and the land that produces it. 
Um, next one? Or, yeah, fine. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, well, maybe the next one. <laughs> um, yeah, and then linking back to that, I think this has also brought me a lot of sparks to dive deeper into uh, uh, my ancestry by working with different indigenous women's communities and also communities from all over the world in the global south. Um, I mean, anywhere from the Paleolithic times until the Neolithic times, which is 25,000 years ago until around 4,000 years ago, God was a woman. Um, this has been widely described in incredible archaeo mythology. And there was peace on earth, so there, was no, um, there were no weapons found. And creation was always done within the temples. And I think who have preserved this in the most incredible way, this really deeper connection, are the indigenous women that are still um, weaving, weaving worlds together. So, I mean, what, what I find obviously fascinating is the correlation between, for example, urban planning, mm -hmm. working conditions, so industrialized like factory processes. We know that uh, in the second wave of industrialization, like basically not only the cities like London were so polluted that the English needs to invent basically the mountaineering and the sanatorium because the wealthy class couldn't anymore really live with pneumonia and tuberculosis in the city of London. So there's a huge um, revolution happening then through Bauhaus. But mm -hmm. Bauhaus is actually also accelerating somehow the industrialized process, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because if you see um, a natural process of, um, of production as you're supporting it, and, and this brings me then also to, to Nina Gualinga. Um, then uh, you, you, you see that work can be also um, something that brings well-being. Yeah? So you don't have this kind of um, artificial division between working and recreation, but you can actually make your work something that is also recreative. Uh, Nina, you grew up between Sweden and your community, uh, the Kitschwa of Sarajaku. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how these two worlds differ? And uh, you also prepared some pictures, I think, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, as uh, Mikolas, Mikolai was saying, I, can you all hear me? No. The Is sound my mic on? on? No? Hello? I don't think my mic is on. No. OK, thank you. <laughs> um, so I grew up in an indigenous community in the Ecuadorian Amazon, where my family is from. And um, I grew up very far away from mobile phones, computers, cars, electricity. Um, we drink the water directly from the rivers. We fish, we hunt. Uh, we build our own houses with the materials from the Amazon rainforest. Um, we speak to the plants. We sing to the earth. Um, and we live in harmony and balance with the mother, our mother earth. Um, but when I was about eight years old, there was an oil company that came to my community um, uh, in search of oil. And my community is 136,000 hectares of am pristine um, Amazonian rainforest. And they offered us $10,000 um, which was about $10 per person, so that we would uh, give up our land for them to exploit oil there. And all of this um, was in the name of development, uh, in the name of progress, and I'm sure that all of you are very familiar with these terms and words, and um, I think that... Um, the word progress and development um, has a different representation here than what it probably has in my community and in many indigenous communities around the world. Um, did you know that indigenous people make up less than 5% of the world's entire population, yet we, on our land, which makes up 30% of the land uh, of the Earth, we hold more than 84% of the world's biodiversity. And most of this is under the custodianship and care of indigenous women. 
Why? Because indigenous women work the land. As I was saying, we sing to the earth. When we plant our food, we sing to the earth so that the food can grow, so that we can feed our children and our families. And for us, um, the concept of development and progress that these oil companies and fossil fuel industries, mining, uh, road building, um, logging, the concept of progress that it brings to us is foreign. It is not progress, it is not development. For us, it is the death of our future generations and our planet. How do we define progress and well-being? It is fertile soil, fresh water, clean air, solidarity of the community and our family, and happiness. That is what we define as well-being, as progress. Um, and um, we're all from the earth, right? Everyone in here, we come from the earth. No matter if we live in an indigenous community or we live in a big city, we are all from the earth. We eat from the earth, we drink the water from the earth, we breathe the air, we're, we're all dependent upon the earth. So our well-being is interconnected with the well-being of the earth. If the planet is well, if the planet is healthy, so are we. If the soil is healthy, we have good food. If the waters are clean, the rivers are clean, we have good water. So in order for us to be well, we also have to take care of our planet. And right now, the guardians of the planet are indigenous people and indigenous women who are protecting not only the Amazon rainforest, but across the world, in all the different continents, are protecting indigenous land, rivers, mountains, glaciers, forests, animals, and biodiversity. And our lives are interconnected. Even if you didn't know that, the future of indigenous people and your own future is connected. Thank you so much, Nina. So, Moran Tev, um, you are a neuroscientist and professor at the Kellogg School of Management. We see that everything what Nina just said, it's also pointing towards a fact, a fact that in 2020, the total anthropogenic human transformed mass, that is death, exceeded all the biomass on the planet. We did it, we are 0.01% of the biomass on the planet, 85% uh, of the biomass our plants are able to do photosynthesis, are creating actually what our brain needs every day, the oxygen. How do you see this connection between the big picture, the planetary picture, and the well-being of every you know, neuronal connection in our brain? So I guess I'm presenting the Western world and the Western science in this panel. And in that sense, I think that there is like a nice connection between what we learn right now and what a lot of historical Kind of data showed, so we kind of rediscover a lot of things that many people have known for a while. At the same time, I think that what science does that's really nice is it adds vigor to that in a way that is replicable and controlled. So, for instance, we have no evidence that singing to flowers makes them grow better, and, and we still do that. So, it's helping the people who do that, for instance, feel good about it, and it creates community, and maybe that in kind of secondary derivative makes people do a better job and help. But the, the question is, like, kind of, if we can figure out how to make the soil grow better, is that in itself enough? So I think where science is spending a lot of time right now is taking the knowledge that works, that, that, that kind of was shown to work, and trying to put some rigor behind it that we can replicate and use more. For example, you spoke in the beginning about architecture. We have kind of intuitions that some things work and some don't work. But finally, for the last couple of years, there's a field called neuroscience of architecture where they essentially test things like, if I'm going to build a hospital, is it better to build a tall tower 
where patients could be in the top floor and look down and feel bigger and greater and grander and then heal? Or should you put them on the ground where they get to kind of walk barefoot and touch the floor and in that sense feel connected to Earth? The answer that we learned is that it depends, but we can actually measure that. So we can take a patient and figure out by looking at his brain and how he responds to medicine, whether he's going to be better on the 10th floor of the UCLA Medical Center or on the ground. Suddenly we have answers. We don't have to kind of speculate on how to build cities. We can test it and get a good answer to what the right architecture is for well-being. When it comes to helping kind of uh, groups who want to get better, I think that most people here, when they came to a panel about well-being, assume that they're going to learn something that they can take themselves tangible and say, okay, I can do A, B, C, D and get better. So we have intuitions, but we can also learn, for instance, that sleeping that many hours will make you happier, that helping other people and having interaction with community will make you better, that uh, uh, being religious will make you better. So we, we have all kinds of like, data now that translates all the knowledge that the, the three women who spoke before me suggested into something that we can then take not just to small groups of people in all over kind of the world, but to everyone. So everyone can leave this room with some concrete thing. And I think where neuroscience is spending a lot of time right now is trying to take what we know from the past and add a number, a pill, a drug, a neurosurgery, or just a process by which people can get better. In that sense, I feel that kind of the Western world is somewhat ridiculed, kind of uh, as like uh, the people who come with a check for $10,000 and just try to get everyone away. But at the same time, I think if we find a way to come and give, not just give the money and take the land, but actually work with the people on the land, you can actually find a really good mix that makes all kind of groups, the Western medicine with the very ancient tradition, work together and get people to have better life. I mean, at the end, I will just quote uh, the minister, federal minister at the opening of the One Health Institute. She said that uh, we were so good in our disciplines, so specialized, so successful, that we just forgot that they are interconnected and we need to look back into one health, the, the health of the planet and the health of the human from one perspective. Thank you very much. Big round of applause for the panelists. Thank you very much.